Hello and welcome to this special edition of Perspectives coming to you from the heart of Jakarta. No surprises why we're here in the Indonesian capital for our first overseas foray. Home to over 240 million people, Indonesia is Southeast Asia's largest country and widely tipped to become Asia's next powerhouse. Indonesia's politics is stable and its economy strong. In fact, the country is experiencing something of a growth spurt with billions of dollars invested in the country country last year alone. But while it's become the darling of foreign investors, some observers are less enthused, pointing to problems with corruption, poverty and a crippling lack of infrastructure. Will those issues stand in the way of Asia's third giant reaching its full potential? Well, joining me today to discuss this is Himawan Harioga, Deputy Chairman of Investment Promotion at Indonesia's Investment Coordinating Board, Stefan Kerbeli, the World Bank's Country Director for Indonesia, His Excellency H.S. Dillon, a key political activist for decades now. He's also President Yudo Yono's special envoy for poverty alleviation. And Natalia Subagio, chair of the executive board of Transparency International here in Indonesia, a leading global anti-corruption NGO. Welcome to all of you. Now let's take stock of Indonesia and where it is uh, standing right now. Five to six percent uh, GDP growth every year over the past 10 years. The country's been attracting a phenomenal amount of foreign direct investment. We had 23 billion US dollars invested in the country last year alone. Now the country stands as the 16th largest economy in the world today and it's tipped to become the seventh largest in the world come 20. 30. This is an enviable track record by any standard, given the fact that 15 years ago, the system here, the politics was in total collapse. You've had a couple of changes of presidency. You've had a couple of economic shocks and meltdowns. So how has Indonesia managed to land so squarely on its feet? Let's start with you, Hamawan. What we have right now is uh, basically a combination of uh, good policy, and also good luck. <laughs> and this is because uh, the current global situation is uh, such that, that, that the investors um, are left with uh, not so many options of investment destination. You know, if you talk about um, investment destination, now Asia has become the uh, center of attention. We talk about Asia, we have China, we have India, and we have ASEAN. And as you said before, that's Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and Indonesia is part of that. You know, it's the largest uh, country in Southeast Asia. We we are 48 percent of the Southeast Asia economy in terms of population. We are uh, we have 42 uh, percent of the Southeast Asia population. You know. In addition to that, we have to say that uh, now we have challenge. You know, in the sense that we have to take care of this. Uh, the pull factors, you know, because uh, the the good luck, you know, part is uh, because of the uh, global current situation. But what we need to take care of the uh, infrastructure, and good governance. You know. Your institution, your agency, the World Bank, basically you were warning Indonesia not to become complacent. Um, do you think that Indonesia has taken its growth uh, for granted? Because Samoan is saying here, well, they have to look and take care of the pull factors. So are they really being complacent here? So when you, when you look at Indonesia's history of the last 15 years, it's indeed a, a, a tremendous success story. As you pointed out, there's now political stability. It's been uh, very stable in terms of its macroeconomic policies. Millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. And uh, the economy has provided jobs for millions of people. And, and indeed, what we're seeing is a, a tremendous structural transformation of the economy. Indonesia has truly emerged as the next giant in Asia and is rightfully claiming its, its role on the global stage as a country that is now a member of the G20, that is engaged in local and regional and global debates. It's making a contribution in terms so, of sharing its experience. So, so why did so, you say that they're, they're being very complacent so think, if they're doing so many think, things right here? I think Indonesia has indeed um, not just had very good policies, but has also been lucky. In a way, what you could say, it's, it's uh, focused on what you could say three C's, if you want. One is its um, reliance on commodity exports. The second one is on the relative costs 
of its manufacturing exports, which has been uh, tremendously successful in, in for its exports, and then thirdly, its growing consumer market. So if you think of this as a stool with three legs, when we look in the future, all of these are still there, but they start to wobble a little bit. And the reason is that if you look at commodity exports, for instance, the price of commodities, of course, has been declining, and it's clear that Indonesia cannot only rely on commodity exports in the future. If you look at the relative costs of its manufacturing exports, uh, its currency has been appreciating against relative car relatively to other currencies in the region. And then finally, the consumer market is still very robust, but even there, there's a danger of seeing some weakening. So the, the question is, are policymakers stepping up to the challenge mm -hmm. to embrace the opportunity now to lay the foundation for longer-term growth? Do you think, Natalia, that policymakers are stepping up to this challenge? Do you think that the policymakers here um, and the officials have become too complacent, that they've made too much of the, of, of, of the good news? Yes, I do think they have become somewhat complacent. Um, but having said that, uh, in the back of their minds, they at least know that there's a lot of work to be done, um, especially in our fight against corruption, which is an, an, a never-ending struggle, uh, and also improving the quality of our civil service. Uh, but Himawan earlier said that you know, our, our achievements have, have been because of good policies and good luck. But as an ordinary citizen, I want it more to be because of good policies rather than good luck. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where we need to do a lot of work. Uh, Dylan, let me bring you into the conversation now. Uh, you know, Natalia is saying, you know, is, is, could the policy actually be better? What do you think uh, the president could have done um, better in terms of steering the economy? Well, he knows what needs to be done because he studied economics, you see. The point is that uh, you cannot use the same methods that uh, Suharto had employed to run this country. Now you have regional autonomy, you have freedom of speech and even freedom after speech, you see? So people can ridicule the president. That is something unheard of in Javanese society. Right? So the president, to be fair, has been doing the best that he can. Now, what Himawan had said, that good policies and good luck, I think there's more than that. There are a lot of people doing good work, a lot of people doing hard work. What you need to do now is to work smarter. Is it just a matter of working smarter? Because hasn't the president himself said um, this report by his own delivery unit, which is charged with making sure that his instructions are carried out. Now, that showed that 50% of his orders weren't being followed uh, by his ministers. His push to cut uh, fuel subsidies, for example, that was totally uh, shot down. So isn't that an example of the fact that the president's hands um, are also tied? No, the point is that you're having a democracy that the sequencing, according to me, was not correct. So you have this uh, pol political parties who think that because they have supported him and they have positions there, that they can do whatever they like. Same goes for those in the regions. They're not from his party. They say, well, we were elected. Why do we have to listen to you? But isn't this a presidential system? It's not so much a parliamentary it system. It is a presidential system on paper. But the way it is working right now, it is also sort of a parliamentary system. So is there any kind of constitutional confusion we're dealing with here in terms of uh, the government actually pushing uh, the economy along and the country along as fast as it should be doing? Stefan, what do you think? I can't com uh, comment on the constitution, but I think what uh, is very clear is that there uh, is a growing consensus in terms of the policies that need to be implemented. Uh, we've already, I think, highlighted the importance of macroeconomic policies, the very strong consensus around fiscal consolidation, the debt to GDP ratio that's been declining, but also on more controversial policies like the fuel subsidies. It's very clear, I think, now that uh, this is not only um, a prudent policy that needs to be done, but also a policy that is ab about fairness and environmental sustainability, mm -hmm. of course. So, uh, because it's, I think, become very clear to policymakers, irrespective of their political background, that uh, fuel subsidies essentially are benefiting the richer and are not benefiting the poor. So mm -hmm. it's now a question of designing the right policies around that to compensate the poor for losses. Sure, but for a president which had or came into office with, with mm -hmm. such a strong personal mandate, mm -hmm. uh, do you find it surprising that he sort of lost a lot of that uh, finesse, that sort of power so early uh, before the end of his term, Natalia? Uh, I think 
to a certain extent, this is a lost opportunity. Um, we did have a lot of faith in SBY for his second term, and we had expected him to be a little bit more forceful, um, able to take the difficult decisions, but this hasn't come about, and partly it is because of our uh, democratic uh, institutions, the way our society now is, uh, it is uh, indeed more difficult to push your way through, but um, it can be done when when it is necessary. It should be done. Would you agree? A good first term, but uh, a not so uh, impressive second term. Part of the difficulties is because uh, since 2001, we have entered the decentralization era, you know, in which most of the authority, uh, which used to be on the hand of the central government, has been uh, given to the uh, um, local and regional governments, sub-national governments, you know. And um, it came in a sudden, you know, decentralization plus uh, democratization at the same time, you know, without any uh, transition period, you know. In Phil the Philippines, for example, it takes about uh, 11 years um, as a transition period, but it's, it's not in our case, you know. It's, this part of the difficulties that we are facing now. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's hold that thought. We're going to go for a commercial break now, so do stay with us here on Perspectives. Welcome back to Perspectives. Now, we were talking about how Indonesia's democracy and the decentralization of the government has made it difficult for the president to move. Let me throw the discussion open to the floor right now. We're going to take our first question. Okay, my name is Peter Fanning, chairman of the International Business Chamber. When Indonesia was opened up to foreign investment, the economists advised that the rules be kept simple. They've become more and more complicated as the years have gone by. Is this necessary? Let me put that to Himawam, the fact that the rules have become more and more complex in Indonesia, especially for foreign investors, as he's saying. Is this necessary? You know that we have a, a negative list of investment, which is uh, your first book to look at you know, before uh, deciding to, to enter Indonesia, to invest in Indonesia. The trend, I can tell you that, you know, because uh, the negative list of investment is um, reviewed, is subject to review every maximum three years, you know. And if you can look at the trend, you know, you can, you can see that the trend is that the list becoming shorter and shorter, meaning that the um, business sectors open to investment is becoming more and more. Now, we are requiring greater value added. You see, and that is very important because otherwise we are heading for a middle income trap. Yes. Yeah. If we don't learn to innovate, if we don't increase value, then we're not going to go places. Let me come back to the complexity of doing business because we know that foreign investors basically, they want a predictability, a certain certainty in the business environment. And really many people still feel that that isn't here in Indonesia. Wouldn't you say, Stefan? I think what uh, foreign investors are telling us when we ask them and enterprise surveys confirm is that they really want three things. They want clarity, they want consistency, and they want something that's difficult in Indonesia often, and that's coordination. And um, one of the key issues in Indonesia is really to sustain this movement towards greater competitiveness. And I think that's one of the key policy challenges in Indonesia in the future, to maintain that outlook for investors where you don't have sudden surprises, you don't have uh, policies that are suddenly changed overnight, but have a clear and consistent outlook. And in that environment, you can also afford salary increases. You can afford minimum wages that keep pace with productivity increases, provided mm -hmm. it's, it's predictable. In that environment, I think it's important. The point that Padilan made, I think, is very important. I, I think from, from our perspective, we very much share the policy objective of creating value added indeed moving up the value chain in, in Indonesia. At the same time, you have to very carefully look at the policies that are most effective to achieve that objective so that you don't create distortions, you don't create surprises for investors, and you move to the area where it's most effective, which is typically in the area of innovation, of creating an environment that enhances skills, mm -hmm. that invests in human capital, that addresses the logistic costs, that creates infrastructure, and that provides an environment for competitiveness to improve. All right, can we take another question from the floor now? My name is Gus Goh from the uh, Singapore Association in Indonesia. 
Uh, we know that the economic development in Indonesia is booming. But Indonesia is still some distance behind your neighboring competitors like Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand in overall access to knowledge and skill. In the World Bank's uh, Knowledge Economy Index, Indonesia in 2012, its rating had fallen to the levels below that of 2000. Although the substantial economic progress has been made, significant investment is still necessary to build up the capacity, levels of skills, and of the knowledge of the workforce to fulfill Indonesia's economic ambitions. In recent policy making in the Ministry of Education, I do not know why English has been taken out and even science has been put aside. So the alignment of the economy and the education sector do not seem to be aligned. The question rightly points at a key challenge, which is that for a growing economy, a G20 economy you, that is increasingly moving towards the service orientation, you need a labor force that, that has the skills to um, be competitive in a global arena in an environment where other countries in the regions are heavily investing in, in, in investment, in, in education. Now, Indonesia has taken the right steps in heavily investing in education. 20% of its budget is now mandated to go to education, an excellent step, very good. Now, but when you look more closely at the education outcomes, you see that that investment has not led to a commensurate education outcome. And that's really a key policy challenge to make sure that this um, scarce resource, which is your budget, the taxpayer uh, resources are being put to effect mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and create in, indeed the skills that you need for a growing economy. And what's, what's clear is that um, other countries in the regions are doing that and Indonesia still uh, is lagging behind in, in many of the skills, particular in the service industry that are needed mm -hmm. to create the good higher value added jobs that are needed for a growing economy. Okay, what about infrastructure? Because, you know, that is also another sort of major growth inhibitor. Now, we know Indonesians are not totally keen on putting their money or leaving their money on the table for really long periods of time. And when it comes to infrastructure uh, development and investments, which are seldom short term, then it gets all very dicey. Do you think, again, in terms of a reallocation of expenditure, that the government should actually be uh, doing more in terms of infrastructure? We have. Uh national midterm, I mean uh, medium term development plan. There is an indication of the need for uh, in infrastructure uh, financing for as much as about 200 billion uh, US dollar you know, uh, in order for us to maintain our uh, growth you know, at about on average 6.4 to 7 percent during the period of 2010 and 2014. Mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of uh, fiscal capacity, the state budget can only finance about 30 percent or one third of that amount. You know, and, and uh, if you add the uh, local government, you add another 20 percent. So, so the rest must come from the private sector. That's why uh, the policy, uh, the strategic policy, is to promote the uh, the provision of infrastructure. Uh, with public-private partnership schemes. Mm -hmm. And we have almost everything. We have the PPP book, we have a list of 80-something, 50-something uh, projects, you know, with the uh, indication of investment required, you know. And we have um, our master plan for uh, acceleration and uh, enhancement of economic development. We have all, almost everything. We have policy measures. You know. What we need to do is to, you know, to show our capacity to implement just implementation is the key. Where yes. are you building the infrastructure? What are you building it for? Whom are you building it for? If the government is investing, we have seen now that everything is done on Jakarta. Everything is done on Java. This is the time for government to move out, to build infrastructure there that you attract winners. You bring winners. You don't throw out the losers here on Transmigrasi. And you don't keep on investing in infrastructure in Jakarta. This is Indonesia, it's not Java alone. That is what needs to be seen.
speaking of implementation, what about uh, this problem of corruption and the eradication of corruption? Is enough being done uh, to do battle with corruption in Indonesia? We know there were quite a few high-profile corruption scandals involving uh, members of the ruling party. Um, is that uh, uh, under control? Never enough uh, is being done in the fight against corruption. But um, at least we all recognize the seriousness of corruption, and the government also clearly recognizes it. Uh, in, uh, last year, in, uh, in May last year, uh, we came out with a national strategy for corruption eradication. It's, it's a document only, yes, at the moment, but at least it's there. Uh, we recognize the issue. We, we, we need to know what, what has to be done. But corruption is very difficult to tackle, and it involves um, changing mindsets. Uh, within the public sector, the corruption is, is, is rife, and it, now it's worsened because there's a collusion between the executive, the legislative, plus the businessmen. Uh, and, and this is borne out by the various scandals that have come up in the press. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to raise them here, but uh, it, it is a, it's, uh, we're not making any progress. Uh, we're making progress. We're doing the right things on paper, but implementation-wise, it's not enough. And it is not enough also to just rely on the government to, 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 to take the initiative. This needs a concerted effort from everybody concerned. The citizens need to be aware of their rights that they have a right to better public services. They have, to, they have a right to access of information. So everybody has to be involved. The private sector has to be involved too because it takes two to tango. So um, you know, it's, it's not enough to just complain about corruption and to, to lament corruption. Uh, it is here, it is a very serious problem and it has to be tackled uh, properly. And we can also not rely just on the KPK. So everybody has to be involved. It's not enough to just rely on the government. Okay, let's uh, hold that thought. We've got to go for another commercial break, so stay with us. Welcome back to the special edition of Perspectives, where our focus this month is on Indonesia. Let me get back to the floor again. We have, uh, we're going to take another question from the floor. Uh, my name is Spanio. My name is Nurul Ivan from BKPM. And uh, the questions to Ibu Natalia, you did mention that when we talk about corruption eradication, it is related with the mindset changing that we have to have. So it means that it was also the big hope that we have when we are having a kind of uh, changing the era from a uh, uh, new era of Orde Baru to the, uh, our era now. It was a hope that we have a kind of new mindset that we are doing something the better for the country. But finally, we realized that until this time that this mindset is not there yet. So I would suggest that uh, those who are inside of the government side as well as uh, those who are outside of the government, uh, government uh, uh, sectors, they have to think of the way, not only hoping of the changing of mindset, leaving it to the people by themselves, but you have to think of the very strategic way. Because sometimes, for me myself, I, I come into the conclusions that the people will not change their mindset until we force them to change their mind. Like the way Singapore uh, are having this kind of thing, they push all the people to do something better than the previous one. What do you think, Natalia? I mean, can we force a, a change in mindset with regards to corruption? A changing mindset, is, it, it cannot be done overnight. And even 15 years of reform is not enough to do that. But what, do, what we do need is better law enforcement. Uh, our law enforcement agencies have to be able to operate um, uh, more effectively. What we do need is administrative reform so that the civil service uh, understands what it means to become a civil service with an emphasis on service and not on power. Um, the government has come out with a grand design for uh, bureaucracy reform, and this grand design involves uh, several areas of, of change, and one of them is changing the mindsets. But uh, to change mindsets, you need to change structures, you need to change work processes, you need to have a recruitment system uh, for civil service, which, de which depends on um, merit, uh, and on um, professionalism. Now, all these things are a work in progress. So um, it, it takes time, but I think we get, we're, we're making little, little baby steps towards no, that is, effort. This is not just moral suasion. There is a logic to the corruption. And you have been, this is fighting in the trenches. Blood has to be drawn. Okay? So 
all these plans that Natalia is talking about, with all due respect, I don't believe in this Bapanas and all these sort of things. We prepared, and President Susilo knows, because he was my chair, when I was executive director of the partnership for governance for about three years, we set up this anti-corruption commission. Mm. But the idea was at that time to set up this commission, but also to clean up the police, mm. the attorney general's office, and we spent lots of money, lots of donor money for the funds, even for the Supreme Court. Mm. Now the point is, who has the guts to push this through? Most of these ministers, when I was head of it, I said, hey, you pulled this through. We gave this to the president. 16th of August, I had this handed, the Sultan of Jogja handed to the Sultan, uh, the president, the president, candidate at that time, roadmap for governance reform that we had prepared. Then in 2006, he turned to me, he said, could you prepare a bureaucratic reform? We did that. They have to fight this. But isn't the KPK, the anti graft Commission, mm -hmm. I mean, aren't they fighting in the trenches? Haven't they been very, very ferocious? And aren't we really also seeing a lot of the parliamentarians yes. trying to curb their power, trying to yes. curb their movement? And so Susilo where has do we go been helping them. Susilo has allowed his, his in-law also to be put in jail. But has he really done enough? But you see, when you are sitting there, when you are trying to have a strategy, where do you head? Now we are getting to the generals, okay? And one thing leads to another. We hope this will unfold. But you have to keep pushing, keep pushing. Susilo is also pushing, but he doesn't want to tear the envelope too. No, the, the, peop the people are pushing. The people are pushing. The people are demanding that corruption be eradicated. Um, at the moment, the KPK is the, our only credible institution fighting corruption. And it has been weakened, or attempts have been made by Parliament to weaken its authority, and which is to be expected, which is to be expected. The taller the tree, the, the stronger the wind. But it's because the people are demanding that uh, we tackle this problem seriously, that it is the people that are coming behind the but KPK. But unless the people throw out these politicians, that's what I was talking <laughs> about, democracy. Mind you, Natalia, when I talk about democracy, it's the but, uh, quality of the politicians, the political parties. So You don't have political parties now here. Okay, let's take another question. Let's go to the floor again. I'm uh, Jim Castle from the American Chamber of Commerce. I have a question on the investment climate. It's increasingly being talked about among businessmen, both foreign and domestic, that the government is becoming increasingly intrusive and micromanaging business and seems to treat business as a tool of public policy rather than an independent engine of growth. And I just would like to uh, ask if this observation is shared by any of the panelists and what they see the role of the private sector going forward. Is the government micromanaging business here in Indonesia? I don't think so. You know, because uh, in terms of uh, investment climate, it depends on where you uh, look at the issue. Uh -huh. uh, we have said uh, in our national program that the uh, Improving investment climate is uh, one of the national uh, priority, you know. And we have done at the macro level, at the meso level, and at the micro level, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the KPM, for example, you know, uh, because we are fully aware that we don't have that enough uh, authority with us, you know, uh, in terms of licensing, in terms of policy, you know. Uh, we take the approach of doing what we can do, you know, doing the simple things, you know, in terms of uh, creating uh, uh, better investment climate. Uh, take an example of the um, streamlining uh, business uh, licensing, uh, business registration, investment registration, for example, you know. We do it at our uh, office, uh, in our one-stop service office, and we also encourage the uh, regional uh, government, the local government, to, to do the same so, to, to do the same thing, you know. And we also, uh, you know, try to use this uh, uh, more carrots than stick. Yes. The point is, the government is not doing enough to have a grip on the economy. Today, the prices of onions and shallots have risen fivefold. 
It could have never happened in Malaysia, could have never happened in Singapore. Jim, they are just letting the businesses get away with murder here. Well, you know, well, but let's, let's come back to this about, you know, whether or not the government is actually micromanaging um, business. I mean, better bureaucracy, better infrastructure, less corruption, more transparency, and these could well be the same problems uh, Vietnam and maybe India uh, were facing some time ago. And maybe 10 years ago, people thought that uh, the likes of Vietnam, the likes of India, could uh, get through those hurdles and become the next investment destination. Isn't Indonesia sort of worried about going down that route, sort of losing its place in the sun, if it doesn't move fast enough to fix some of these problems? Mm -hmm. So Indonesia, I think, indeed has very good growth prospects and is moving along in the right path. But it's because of that that Indonesia needs to be very concerned uh, not to have policy steps that are short-term oriented and that are not clear and consistent. And some of the recent measures, I think, have created uncertainty amongst investors, uh, whether it's uh, minimum wage uh, uh, increases or whether it's uh, the complicated import licenses or restrictions in foreign direct investments or the logistics costs. All of these are issues where maybe there was um, a policy objective to move up the value chain, but they have created distortions and uncertainty for investors. And it's particularly important that in Indonesia keeps the go, keeps the, the view on the on the big price which is moving up the in in, in 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 terms of becoming an emerging middle income country that provides jobs for a, a growing population yeah. that addresses regional imbalances yeah. and that embraces the opportunities of a global market so as as the country actually keeps its eyes on on the prize i mean is this prize really being shared amongst the people of indonesia i want to talk about the social issues here and whether or not uh, the growth here has been as inclusive as it should be not enough, you can see that people who have Lamborghinis and Maseratis, they don't want to give $200 a month to their employees, you see. And they say, oh, the government is forcing us. Cheap wages means poverty. You have, there are more Maseratis and Lamborghinis mm -hmm. here than any capital in Southeast Asia. It is a fact that the income gap is widening. According uh, to the World Bank, the combined wealth of Indonesia's 40 richest people is actually equivalent uh, to that of about 60 million um, of its poorest citizens. Is the government doing really enough to ensure that, that economic growth on the benefits of that is being really spread right across the board? Over the last 10 to 15 years, Indonesia has indeed been very successful in lifting millions of people out of poverty. But at the same time, what we see more recently is a worsening of the Gini coefficient, mm -hmm. so the uh, indicator of inequality. And it's exactly as uh, Padilan uh, points out, that cuts to the core of social cohesion here. Uh, and what people, I think, increasingly want to see is opportunities for a growing middle class so that people move out of poverty and into a bracket where they can uh, have access to the consumer goods. And indeed, Indonesia has um, been very successful in, in having an, a large part of the population that indeed now has access to consumer goods, but they're still very vulnerable to shocks. Mm -hmm. They're vulnerable to economic shocks, they're vulnerable to natural disasters, they're vulnerable uh, to um, a lack of opportunities provided by lack of education. And it's, I think, here where public policy can step in and provide a better social security um, network, a better social safety net, better education, and also the skills and innovation that is needed uh, for particularly young people to enter the labor market and get access to better jobs. Well, according to the Indonesian government, there are about 30 million Indonesians, or just 12% of the population, living below the poverty line. Do you think the government is understating poverty? Indonesia is not just Java. We, go to, we just go across to the eastern Indonesia and there you see poverty. And I don't think anybody is paying uh, any attention to Eastern Indonesia or taking mm -hmm. the right measures to improve the poverty levels there. Increasingly in the mind uh, of policymakers is that Indonesia is becoming an increasingly urbanized country. So uh, urbanized countries, half of the population now lives in cities. And so while you still have a lot of poverty in uh, the eastern part of Indonesia, you also see a lot of growing poverty in the cities. So right here in Jakarta, you see tremendous wealth but also abject poverty next door to mm. each other. Dylan, you're the special envoy of the president in terms of alleviating poverty in this country. What's being done to eradicate poverty in this country? Why is the poverty line being set at about 86 US cents uh, when the World Bank, the likes of the United Nations and the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, set it at two bucks? 
the best answer, of course, is to be, allow comparison, okay, because you had that for a long time. Of course, the Chinese have been doing very good. When they achieve this, then they move the rung a little bit up, and they move the bar. But the President Susilo himself, as uh, Stefan knows, has been very interested in fighting poverty. In fact, his clusters and all that are his strategy. And he recognizes that, but there is just so much he can go. Money, we had, Stefan and I have been working, looking at this, the budget allocations toward poverty alleviation have risen many fold, but things are not happening. And why? Because the regions, I go to the regions, I talk to the governors and all this, and the money is, they say, oh, Padilan, we need more money. I said, well, the money that we have given you, you are spending 70% of the budgets just on yourself. Mm. All right, we've got to go for another can, break can, now. Can Do come back with us here on Perspectives. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here on Perspectives. We're coming to you from Jakarta. Now, there is certainly a laundry list of issues for the president to sort out. The question here is, can we really expect any kind of major policy breakthrough in his uh, remaining term? No. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, because uh, at the moment, the, major, uh, the, pres the president himself is facing, I think, one of his biggest crises ever and that is with his own uh, uh, political party. There's so much work to be done there uh, that I don't think there'll be any, any, any attention paid to, to, to the issues of, of governing. Uh, the next 18 months or so, we will just see nothing but political uh, um, infighting, political bargaining, and collusion between the political parties and the executive, so it's not going to be pretty, I'm, I'm sure. Do you agree that it's not going to be pretty? It's going to be um, a, a lot of this horse trading behind the scenes? No, I'm actually hoping that uh, President Susilo does away with this, uh, all these energy subsidies, uh, fuel subsidies, and then uses the money in a good way to fight poverty. Horse trading, of course, and I hope this KPK then, uh, they are now investigating these political parties, and that goes in there. Then this will rain that little bit, but we have to change the whole electoral system. So yeah. that but are you being too hopeful here? I mean, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, the, the Indonesian economy has done so well uh, doesn't or hasn't actually stopped the government from actually implementing certain measures which uh, look increasingly nationalistic, even uh, protectionist, uh, with a slew of measures taken recently to limit foreign ownership of mines, of banks, to curtail imports of other animal products. Um, couldn't this really end up hurting growth in the meantime, in the rest of this term? Stefan? I think Padilan rightly pointed out that this, the, most, the simplest policy uh, uh, change that could be implemented in the remaining term of the president is really the fuel subsidy, which is fundamentally unjust and is uh, essentially benefiting the richer. It benefits the car owners who essentially receive a subsidy of about $100 a day when the poorer people who don't have a car received maybe a dollar a day. So that's fundamentally unjust and could be rectified. But in the meantime, um, diverting too much attention on import restrictions, on uh, efforts that are um, administrative and that are uh, uh, essentially targeted at uh, moving up the value chain but are not mm. very effective but are confusing investors and are creating uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Those are not the policies that uh, are probably the most effective in signaling that Indonesia is on that growth trajectory. Mm -hmm. Well, labor groups here in, in, in Jakarta mm -hmm. and, and across the archipelago, uh, they're already becoming increasingly vocal. They're out there on the streets demanding more benefits from the country's economic growth trickled down to them. So are we really going to see something like a, a, a cut of the fuel subsidy? Um, greater accountability, I think, is great for the government, but is this vibrant well, democracy that, that we're seeing here in Indonesia, is that getting very populous and uh, very detrimental to the country? Look, uh, but we, we've, we've talked about the fuel subsidies for God knows how many years. It's been taught to death. It's about time we implement it, and we're not doing that. It's time for action and not just talk, basically. Mm -hmm. do, you see, do you see Indonesia actually taking action um, in the next one and a half years, um, uh, Himawam? We've got uh, four uh, presidential contenders. Uh, they've emerged, some familiar faces, many of them political um, elites. They're already getting very populous in terms of uh, 
the sort of support they want from the people. More assistance to the poor. They're also talking about a lot of protectionist uh, measures. Um, are we really going to see a fuel uh, subsidy cut? I, I would like to put it, put it this way, that the government has already uh, have a five-year development plan, you know, and, and whoever the president uh, who is in power right now you know, uh, must stick to that plan. You know, uh, you know. But the, if, if I may um, comment on this political risk you know, with, uh, in relation to the upcoming uh, uh, presidential election, for example, you know, if your concern is about the consistency of the policy, grand policy in particular, you know, I think uh, the risk is particularly, I mean, uh, is relatively uh, limited, you know. Why? Because this is important to highlight that first, uh, we have this uh, long-term development plan already, you know. It is by law, law number 17 of 2007, you know, that laid down all the grand uh, vision and mission of the nation. And according to the another law on the direct presidential election, whoever the candidates, you know, must have the vision and mission uh, that is in accordance to this uh, grand vision and mission. So there is no way for he or she to deviate from this grand policy. So you are know, you think. saying that basically what we're hearing here mm -hmm. is just part of the election rhetoric that this sort of uh, nationalism or a bit of the ultra-nationalism that we're witnessing here is not a serious problem, that it's all going to go away after the elections, Dylan? That this is not just nationalism, okay? This is a way of moving up the value chain. Yes. So otherwise, you are heading for the middle income trap. But yes. there is a lot of rhetoric there too. There is the rhetoric. It's a matter of political will, Natalia. It's political capacity that is missing. <laughs> Do you agree? I mean, that whoever the next president is, he or she, when they get into the office, they are going to abide by, by the rules. They are going to want to fulfill the economic ambitions of this country. Do you agree? If, if we really want to play our rightful role on the world stage, we have to be able to back it all up. And unless we clean up our house, how are we going to back it up? And we have so much to do. But having said that, despite all the problems, I personally believe that this country is on the right track, um, that uh, we, should, we are destined to greater things, but it takes a hell of a lot of work to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. There have been some observers who, who feel that because of uh, the current president's uh, sort of weak hold on power and his weak presidency, that there is almost a growing sense that people want a more strong government, even a more authoritarian government. Do you think that is the case here? I think what you're seeing in Indonesia is that it's a, it's a very complex development agenda and a very complex e economy with a very vibrant democracy that is very decentralized. So you have many different voices that want to move the country in, in, in different directions. But uh, there, there are many factors that also make it uh, very consensus oriented. So I think what's uh, encouraging is that you have a growing middle class that demands better services from government and that is putting pressure on the government to indeed deliver those services. And government is being held increasingly accountable to that. What you have is increasingly a government that is oriented towards performance, sets targets, and is then re-elected on the basis of that performance. So that's very encouraging. What's also encouraging is that the parties, uh, to the extent that uh, as, as, a, as a foreigner I can understand them and comment on them, they don't tend to be very ideological, but essentially share a similar development agenda. Uh, and any government that comes in needs to address the same issues. It mm -hmm. needs to provide the, the, the investment climate for foreign direct investment to come in. It needs to settle uh, economic imbalances in the economy, it needs to address uh, the regional disparities, mm -hmm. it needs to address the vulnerability of a large part of the population that's still subject to poverty and subject to economic shocks, it needs to provide uh, the infrastructure for development, it needs to invest in human capital. All, any government will need to do that in the future. Okay. And tackle corruption. And tackle corruption. <laughs> so a whole laundry list mm -hmm. of, of problems that uh, Indonesia must deal with in order to, com to compete. As you said, infrastructure, corruption, uncertain business climate, etc. But what is the asset test here? I mean, is the asset test a question of 
five years down the road, you know, when the rest of uh, the economies in the rest of the world actually uh, recover, um, is there a fear that foreign investors are going to wake up and look at Indonesia and wonder about Indonesia? Uh, let's start with you, Dylan. We're going to wrap here. Well, you see, the very simple, okay, in democracy, are the democracy dividends being enjoyed by the people? That's more important. You have a lot of investment, but if it's in mining, it's just extractive, what is it doing for the people? So you have to move towards that. The acid test is, is this democracy delivering to the people? Your last word on the future of Indonesia, then. Well, Indonesia is now already uh, back to the radar screen of the investors. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning, that you know, uh, it is because a combination of these uh, pull factors and uh, push factors. Yeah, uh -huh. in the pull factors, you know, we have a good demographic structure, young and um, a dynamic population. You know, we have natural resources. This but is if not they're a, not educated, that is well, a disaster. <laughs> yeah, but we have lucky enough you know, to, to, to have this uh, um, uh, constitution that mm -hmm. ended the 20% of uh, uh, okay. budget uh, uh, to be uh, allocated to the education sector. And mm -hmm. the, the issue is uh, how to uh, better, re, be, better have allocation of uh, yeah. this uh, huge amount of uh, education. Okay, so uh, we need a demographic dividends, we need uh, economic dividends. Well, Stefan, I, I agree that I, Indonesia is well on its way to take its rightful place as one of the strongest, most important economies and democracies in the world. And it has all the ingredients to do that. It has economic stability, it has political stability, it has a, a, a system that accommodates all the various different uh, interests. It has natural resources, it has a young, vibrant uh, population. Uh, and the question is not so much whether Indonesia will deliver the wealth, it's e exactly as Padilan says, it whether it, that wealth is, done, is, is generated and, and distributed in a, in a way that benefits the large part of the population, lets them participate mm -hmm. in this uh, tremendous growth of the economy that will happen over the next few years. Sure. Last word to you. Last word. Oh, I think what is important is indeed education. Education for the people, for the civil service too, for the bureaucrats too, and for the uh, people in the private sector. This, this place is not for the timid. Uh, it's for people who's got a long-term vision. All right. Yeah, uh, on that fun. note, we've got to wrap. This place is really <laughs> not for the timid. It's for people with vision. Thank you all so very much for joining us here uh, on our panel. Thank you to my guests, Himawan Hariyoga from Indonesia's Investment Coordinating Board, Stefan Kerbele from the World Bank, H.S. Uh, Dillon, Special Envoy to the President for Alleviating Poverty, and Natalia Sabago from Transparency International. Indonesia is a fascinating turnaround story that is still being spun. The tsunami, the floods, the struggling economy, those associations are fast fading. It's thriving, it's moderate, and it's still a model for democracy. Is it predestined to be the next China? Well, the jury is still out. We hope you found our discussion thought-provoking. Uh, do help us shape the next episode of Perspectives. You can write or connect with us by leaving your comments on our website, and you can tweet us as well, of course. I'm Leon Peck. Till next time, thanks for watching.